I was born with a heart murmur. So I have oh. two holes in my heart. Yeah. So anytime I would do anything super physical and my heart rate would start to pump, the oxygen in my blood, would, like the blood wouldn't circulate fast enough. So I would lose oxygen very quickly and I would pass out if I did anything too physical. So that's why my cardio is probably yeah. <laughs> not the greatest because I, I avoided physical yeah. activity as a kid for a long time because I didn't want to pass out. Yeah, that's horrible. Because that would happen any time. Like I, I played soccer for a season when I was eight. Yeah. Hated it. Yeah, that's horrible. I just stayed in the goalie position. I was a good ass goalie, but I wasn't running the field. For hockey or soccer? Soccer. Oh, okay, I see. So we got another episode of Adversity Kings. Being a little more selective with uh, with our overall guests and everything and just, just making sure that, you know, we're bringing more value or bringing as much value to the audience as well. And, and ultimately, I want to remind everybody, the vision for AK Media and the AK Podcast is really to be a platform for, you know, creative individuals, but more so just entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, and people building something of value. You know, on a personal level, like Street Fighter, Dragonborn here with us today, Dragonborn MMA, shout out you, Mikey from, from Cleveland? Yes, sir. From Cleveland, Ohio. Yeah, just a platform for, for entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, people building something creative, you know, uh, unique minds. You know, I like learning a lot. So if, if you know anybody or different things like that, I prefer to do it in studio, but I just, I've had two individuals I did virtually. I had the uh, Modern Day Mountain Man. If you guys didn't check out that ap episode, Dude's absolutely nuts, hunting brown bears and everything out in Alaska, 2,000 pound bears and moose and elk. And, you know, that's a really, really crazy episode. And then one of the first virtuals I did was Greg Hatcher. And he's a gentleman I grew up in Arkansas and extremely wealthy, extremely successful. And, uh, you know, I have a saying, it's like, if you have a jet, I'll get you on virtually. But if not, I want you in person. So let's jump in. Dragonborn MMA, let's shout out all your stuff first. Just, uh, I imagine the audience isn't as. But well, in the longer the episodes are, I'm over on Street Beefs right now. That's where I'm fighting at. Um, I got two fights up on YouTube right now on the Street Beefs main channel. Um, shout out Sudden Urge Tattoo Shop in Menor, Ohio. Discount code Dragon, fifteen percent off. Um, yeah. Where else? What about social media platforms? Can people find you anywhere? Dragonborn MMA on Instagram. Anywhere else? That's it. Dope. So, dude, tell us a little bit about your life. Where were you born and raised? Cleveland, Ohio. Cleveland, Ohio. Yep. And then what about mom and dad? What's the whole story with everything? Well, my dad had a Kempo studio when he was younger. Um, Kempo is basically like a, a form of karate, but it's more close quarters than like uh, like a kickboxing range. Yeah. More visceral, yeah. more close combat. Um, and and he, he went around, he traveled, trained with a lot of different people, different martial arts. That was his life for a very long time. So he instilled me, st instilled that in me from when I was a child. But growing up, I was like the wimpier kid, the the nerdier kid. Yeah. You know, I was a geek. My brother was the athletic one. Yeah. He's five years older than me. He was always playing soccer, hockey, football, basketball. I had no interest in that when I was little. Yeah. That, that was his realm. I just sat at home playing Skyrim. I still play Skyrim. Skyrim's really. fire. Greatest game ever. Yeah. 12 years out. Still play it thousands of times. Is there hours. any new versions or maps? Or? They, they re-release it every, like, three years. Yeah. You know, they, they always got new Is editions. Is there multiplayer on it? No, no, no multiplayer. I've never been a multiplayer guy. For real? No Call of Duty or anything? When I was in elementary school, oh, okay. but I, I just fell off of it. Um, but, yeah, I was always that, the, the short, buzz-cut glasses that were too small. Yeah. You know, annoying kid, you know. Yeah. Talk too much. More than I should have. Yeah. People didn't want to listen to me. Yeah. So I started to to quiet out, mellow out. Um, got a lot shyer, more introverted, you know. Um, but over time, eventually, like I started getting a lot into arts. That that was my big thing. Yeah. Any form of art that I could access. I was always drawing things. I would make things out of duct tape, you know, just yeah. props. I was always building things, making costumes. Costume yeah. design was a big one for me. So I was going to Comic-Con. Um, and then I got a job with Simon doing digital media with Peter at all caps. And I, I picked up Photoshop like that because my brother did Photoshop. 
um, for a while, and mm. he turned it into a career. So I was kind of following in his footsteps. Who's the best with the camera? Way. You, Simon, or Luigi? <laughs> Luigi. Oh, Luigi is. Definitely Luigi. Yeah. Sorry, Simon. You ain't the camera guy. You're the email guy. Emo guy. <laughs> Let's go. So when did you meet Simon Luigi? Simon, I've known my whole life pretty much. Elementary school. I mean, we started hanging out in like first grade. Luigi I met in sixth grade. Yeah. And I mean, we hit it off because we always, we like medieval stuff. He was a big Lord of the Rings guy. I was a yeah. big Skyrim guy. Oh, no wonder so. you guys get along with Peter so much. Yeah. I was, probably love my helmet too. Oh, yeah. That was the first thing I spotted in here. Yeah, dude. One of my love favorite it. movies is Troy. Have you seen it? I don't know if I saw Troy. Oh, God. I know 300. I saw 300. Troy is way better than 300, dude. I'll have to check so it have out. Have you read the Iliad or the Odyssey? I haven't read them. I'm I familiar. You like medieval shit, dude. Greek mythology. You're not. I was into Greek mythology more in elementary school, but over time, I mean. Do you like to show the Vikings? Yeah. Yeah. I just, I just finished watching that. After my first fight came out, people were commenting like, oh, this dude watched way too much Vikings. Yeah. I'd didn't never seen watch it. it. That's Everybody's so commenting, oh, you look like Ragnar Lothbrok. Yeah. Who the fuck is Ragnar Lothbrok? Yeah. I checked it out. Beautiful show. Yeah, it's fire. Because I, I, storytelling is, is a big form of art that I got into. I was writing scripts for movies and shit yeah. like that. In high school, I, I wrote a full-length Batman movie, and I was casting actors. I, I set up spots to film in Boston. COVID hit. I never ended up getting to film it. I didn't realize, like, yeah. how expensive that would be. Yeah. Um, I never followed through with it. But the storytelling side of things really resonated with What's me. What's your my favorite life. story? See, that's a difficult question because different Could stories resonate differently in Could different mediums. Could you beat mediums. up a chimpanzee? What? Could you beat up a chimpanzee? Probably. I was watching this chimpanzee. Young one? <laughs> I was thinking that too. I was like, I could get that young one. I was when watching. they get old, they get crazy. They rip yeah, people's dude. arms off and shit. I was watching this documentary. Uh, Joe Rogan had this gentleman named James Reed, and there's a documentary. It's called, like, Chimp Kingdom. It was actually really good, and I, I watched it this weekend on uh, Netflix. I'm looking, and I was like, that's a big fucking chimpanzee. I was like, if I got mad enough, though, I'd get him. Probably not. I mean, this is <laughs> massive, dude. And what's, what's stupid is they're just all muscle. Imagine, like, you know how hard it is, like, you know, holding yourself in a pull-up for... Yeah. I mean, after you do 10 or 15, like 10 or 15 pull-ups, I feel like is the average, like athletic mm -hmm. male pull-ups. Like, all right. But to climb trees like rapidly, like right. all day and like just it, it not, not take any endurance or energy. And I'm like, right. We need spikes and ropes. Yeah, dude. I'm like, I was a lumberjack for a little bit. Oh, okay. That was, that was an interesting that. job. <laughs> and so I'm like looking at these chimps. I'm like, that one, I, the girl one, I'll beat, I'll beat the shit out of that one. <laughs> I was like, that one I'm beating up, that one I'm... But then I'm thinking, like, I don't know, dude, because I've, I've heard from listening to so much Joe Rogan, like, they're very... Obviously, they're very intelligent, but they're strategic, too. Like, like with their fighting, they just go to bite, like, mm -hmm. they'll go straight for your reproductive system, so now you're not listening. Exactly. You know what I mean? They'll they know the weak points. The weak points. Fingers, eyes, so it's like... It's like they know Kempo. Now you're just like, <laughs> is, is that Kempo? Just bite someone's... Kempo answer? had a lot of weak points. Like, when I was growing up, we had a bunch of, like charts in our basement. Demonstrate like, some of these on Simon. All right, come here. <laughs> no. <I'm> no. <laughs> weak points. Let's go. But like solar plexus, stuff like that. Oh, I you know, like deep, the solar, solar plexus, plexus hits. I would die. <laughs> that shit hurts so bad. Yeah, like, I would die. Getting need there. Oh my God. Like one time in one of the MMA classes, I was going for a double leg takedown and dude started to pull guard and I didn't move his legs out of the way. Yeah. And as I'm taking him down, he puts his knee up, and it goes right into my solar plexus. Ooh. That took me out. That's horrible. I, I was out of the count for like five minutes. I couldn't breathe. I was hyperventilating in the yeah. corner. Oh, that's horrible. Those Losing shots. your breath as a kid was some of the most traumatic experiences you've ever had. Oh, absolutely. And like for me, I was born with a heart murmur. So I oh. had two holes in my heart. Yeah. So anytime I would do anything super physical and my heart rate would start to pump, the oxygen in my blood, would, like the blood wouldn't circulate fast enough. So I would lose oxygen very quickly and I would pass out if I did anything too physical. So that's why my cardio is probably yeah. <laughs> not the greatest because I, I avoided physical yeah. activity as a kid for a long time because I didn't want to pass out. Yeah, that's horrible. Because that would happen any time. Like I, I played soccer for a season when I was eight. Yeah. Hated it. Yeah, that's horrible. I just stayed in the goalie position. I was a good-ass goalie. But I wasn't running the field. For hockey or soccer? Soccer. Oh, okay, I see. What about, so when did your beard start growing? 
<laughs> probably like 15 started oh, to Jesus come in I, feel like I had a goatee for a little while simon just got his yeah he did i, just, <laughs> I, I gotta teach him the ways he gotta get a derma roller yeah dude. i've yeah. heard those work i never used anything like that i never needed it <laughs> yeah. i just got beard genetics yeah i have none <laughs> um man so did you have a outside of skyrim did you have a favorite movie or anything growing up the ringer was my favorite comedy movie with johnny knoxville that sounds good huh? I, I watched that it. one too many times but i didn't really have any specifics uh, as a kid and it's still so hard to pinpoint because you go different genres i tend to lean more towards psychological thrillers because they make you think more yeah you know it, more about the mind so stuff like joker yeah. joker was phenomenal love that movie just anything with good storytelling i became a big critic you know and with that uh, i started learning about the hero's journey that changed my life. When I started looking into the hero's journey, it's, it's like the basic structure for good storytelling to, to reach catharsis in the, in the viewer or the reader. So, you know, you have the like main eight points, yeah. resisting the call, meeting the mentor, accepting the call, yeah. low point, climax, that kind of thing. And it, it showed me that in order to become the hero of your own story, mm. you have to be able to endure all of the adversity. Yes, yeah. That's the biggest thing. That's what makes a hero. When you look at the very essence of that, climbing the mountain and slaying the dragon. Yeah. And, that, and that's, that's a big thing, because dragons represent a lot of different things. I fucking love dragons. Oh, if I love If you couldn't dragons. tell, I got dragons here, did you, did dragon you, on the side of my head. Did you like uh, Game of Thrones? Yeah, I just watched Game of Thrones, too. I was late on that. I was late on that. Game of Thrones was good. Hey, we can stop this. No, I'm just I'm playing. <laughs> I didn't stop. Oh, she, she stopped. <laughs> Game of Thrones was good. The Overrated. <laughs> the end of the show fell off so hard because... Nah, I got low standards. End of the show was great. <laughs> the action was great. The storytelling went to shit, to be honest. I honestly all the characters watch it again. All the characters, like, lost the development that they went through. Like, you look at Jamie Lannister. Like, his whole thing was... Good development. Nah, man. His whole thing <laughs> was, like, he was the Kingslayer. He had a horrible reputation. Yeah. Right? But the reason he killed the king was to save the city because he cared about the city. Yeah. He cared about the people in the city. But then you have him in the last season talking to Tyrion. I never cared about the people. I never did. Yeah, that was... That was your whole fucking character. That's no, what made you an interesting. But he switched up. It, it was it was you poor never dated a girl that switched up. Oh, of course. Okay, of exactly. course. But so like, why are you getting mad at a show when all the girls you've dated switched up? Because that's different. <laughs> when you when you're talking about character development, there is none today. We live in America. Yeah, character. But we're talking about heroes. The hero's journey. He's not a hero. Yeah, he, he was. was supposed to be he a villain. He was supposed to be. He was supposed to seem like a villain. What? What kind of hero, hero has? relationships with his uh oh yeah well that, that's too well, much incest in that show that's the other thing like way too much my god this is a major news update just one one second there yes i'm in the middle of a podcast but i could still you have me curious we knew about all that is there any other is there like any articles or anything or is that just it oh yeah they just been tagged all that's outdated and we we are in the process legally of processing all of that so i i've known all that Oh, no, I don't care about anything. <laughs> I, that's how confident I am about all this. All right, I'll hit you up, big dog. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, all my money comes from insurance, so I got to, Of like, course. I stay somewhat locked in. People are like, when, we cut, when we, we cut this up and I'll have my phone, and people are like, he doesn't even care what he's saying. <laughs> I do care. I just, I don't make any money from the podcast, so. Right. Not yet. I got to Not, not yet. yet. Exactly. Not yet. Things build. Um, but the hero's journey, Yes, I started to apply that in, in my life in a lot of different ways because growing up, I didn't have the motivation, you know, I, I didn't have a purpose, you know, I, I had my hobbies, I yeah. had things that I enjoyed and I indulged in those hobbies, anything else I, I didn't care about, Yeah, you know, um, but I, I, I got to a point, my parents split up in 2019. Mm. And I started drinking, and I got put on probation. But how old are you? 
17. You're 17 right now? No, I'm 20 right now. Oh, okay. But like that's the craziest 17 year old beard I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> right? Even 20, dude. Holy shit. Yeah, no, I I got crazy genetics. I mean, I'm gonna be 21 in two weeks, but still. Yeah, I'm gonna be 41 in two weeks with this. <laughs> <laughs> but after my parents split up, you know, like I lived on a big house on a hill. Yeah. I didn't have any worries. You know, everything came easy. Any any tasks that I had to do. I've always been a very quick learner. I pick things up incredibly quick. Like I, I started working in graphic design. I learned Photoshop in a week and I was already pumping out daily posts for Vasu, Sarur, yes. Reyes. Uh, I was go. working with all of them and I was very new to it. Yeah. And then by the time I actually took a class on it, I was teaching the teacher. Yes. You know, Yes. I, I, I just pick things up incredibly fast. That's my mind was always very strong, but I didn't have a strong spirit or a strong body. That that kind of thing didn't matter. I just went day by day. Yeah. But after I got put on probation, I was a big smoker at the time. I smoked a lot of weed in high school. A lot <laughs> of weed. I was trapping. Yeah, like, so did my sister. Oh, I didn't. Right, but I got put on probation. <laughs> I started getting drug tested. I can't smoke weed yeah. anymore, but Ohio alcohol is out of your were, system were in two days. That. Yeah. So I started drinking more. I remember kids getting like arrested for a gram back in like yeah. high school and stuff like that for just. But I stuff. didn't get caught with the weed. I got caught with alcohol. That's what yeah. made it ironic. Yeah. Because alcohol is out of your system in two days. Yeah. I started drinking after I got put on probation. Yeah, yeah. Right. So I was slamming like you, you know those like small Captain Morgan bottles. I was uh, putting down yeah, like three of those a day. Easy. Like it, it was bad. Yeah. It was bad. And then I got into psychedelics. Mm. Right, a lot of acid, too much acid. Okay, shrooms. Yeah, but that started to make me look. What was your c craziest trip? I saw a Tool concert. I don't know if you know Tool. Mm -mm. C incredible band, incredible band. You saw a band? Yeah. While you were tripping? Mm-hmm. Went to the Rocket Mortgage Field House in Cleveland. Wait. Oh, you went there, or like you imagined it? No, I went there. Oh, okay. I, I was went like, there. You imagined a whole concert? Yeah, no, that, that was insane. Listen to Lateralis. Fantastic album. Greatest yeah. album ever. Um, but I started looking within myself more because when I would be tripping, I wouldn't go out and do shit e except for the, that concert. I, I would be sitting, listening to Tool. I would listen to their whole discography in one night. Yeah. Like every album, song to song to song. And they, they get, like, it's a progressive metal band. Yeah. So you have moments of reflection and transcendence in their music, but there's also times where it's super heavy and weird time signatures, off-putting stuff. Yeah. And that can bring a lot of negativity. I've seen people have horrible trips listening to Tool <laughs> because of that, because they let that negativity drive the trip. You know, they start seeing shit, start shaking, start feeling weird things. And they start thinking, you know, why is this happening? Why yeah. is this happening? This shouldn't be happening. Is it laced? You know, mm, that they don't scary. understand that it's a hero's journey. Acid. Exactly. It's a hero's journey. <laughs> you have these negative things yeah. come to you. Yeah, yeah. And it's about sitting there, not being a bitch, taking it oh, God. and learning from it. Oh, that sounds right? so scary. <laughs> and I did that. That just sounds, I just want to like have us like cut this and just be like stuff white people say or do. <laughs> <laughs> you can't be soft you have to just take the ass like what <laughs> what about vegetables or <laughs> eat a piece of chicken <laughs> like go make out with me we'll, we'll sit there we won't be soft we'll have some watermelon like <laughs> but continue with the hero's journey of this <laughs> there was one time i made shroom tea oh my sister does that i was i was laying in bed <laughs> looking at the ceiling <laughs> the ceiling I, became the floor and <laughs> well there was one time I took 18 grams of shrooms. That was crazy. And there wasn't a ceiling. People with me were watching The Conjuring. I'm so glad I wasn't oh my God. in my body for that. That's a horrible idea. Don't watch The Conjuring on a psychedelic. That's horrible. But I, can't, I was sitting I can't there. Watch it. I can't watch it off a normal body. Oh, I love The Conjuring universe. It's great. Oh, God. But that's so horrible. That's I was sitting there thing, looking Satan in the say. eyes. Uh, I was looking Satan in the eyes. <laughs> you have to go home. And <laughs> you have to go. <laughs> dude across the room's like, yo, are you good? And I'm sitting there. I'm like, I'm good. I'm good. And I close my eyes. I'm crying a little bit. And I start to see these lines form. Oh, my God. Right? 
and it starts building this like piece of Norse mythology, oh, right. right? And it starts to zoom out. It's like a, a flip book that I'm seeing in my mind. Yeah. And it starts to pan out and I see myself mm. with all these tattoos, all this Norse shit. I look like a Viking and I was in the octagon. Oh, that's harder. Right? Yeah. And shit started to come to me and I started thinking about MMA and how that business compounds all of the skills that I've learned in my life. Yeah. Right? Like even the costume design, character design, you put that, I, I project that onto myself instead of drawing Moon Knight or drawing like random comic book characters. Mm -hmm. If, if I start designing myself and make myself this mythical character, that's going to make more people want to watch me. Mm -hmm. Instead of just being, you know, a, a normal looking white dude, no tattoos, normal haircut. Yeah. That's not marketable. You put a Viking in a cage, more people are going to watch it. Yeah. And then storytelling. You, you hear Chael Sonnen talk about the biggest thing in marketing a fight is the storytelling. The yeah. who, what, why, where, and when. And how mm -mm -mm. telling that is what promotes a fight. Yes. It, it gets people interested. I worked in social media and digital media for years. Yeah, that's a huge, huge. You have to be able to market yourself. There are so many fighters that expect to make a career out of just fighting. That's impossible. Mm. If you're if you're not marketable, nobody's going to watch you. If you don't know how to promote yourself nobody's going to care. Mm -hmm. And then people are complaining about fighter pay. The fuck are you bringing to the company? Like the UFC, they put on events almost every week where they have like 20 fights. That's like 40 fighters, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Then you have their whole camp, everyone in their corners, their travel, their stay, their food, their training expenses. UFC's covering all of that stuff. Insurance, and they want to bump up the fighter pay for people who aren't bringing any traction for the prelims that people skip. People aren't even watching those fights. And you want to get paid more? You're not doing anything for the company except padding the event. You're just there so they can have more fights. Until you get to the level where, like, Connor's at, it doesn't matter if Connor's winning or losing. People are going to watch Connor. Yeah. Because he marketed himself better than anybody. Mm -hmm. So I had that media experience to be able to recognize that. And I grew up with, f with fighting being part of my life. And it, it just started to come together. But I still didn't have the motivation. Mm. I still didn't have a reason. Yeah. And then Labor Day came in 2021, I believe. It might have been the end of 2020. Uh, I could be wrong on that. Um, but my dad was working the Geauga County Fair. Um, he was with the Freemason booth, just making food for the fair, right? He decided to leave a little bit early because he, he was on his bike. He decided to leave early so he wouldn't have to deal with, like, hitting a deer or something. He didn't want to get into an accident. Yeah. And then he got hit by a drunk driver in an SUV. Oh, my God. Flipped over the SUV. His spine broke in four different places. Hip completely shattered. Broken femurs. Forearms sticking out. Collapsed colon, um, everything inside of him, bunch of internal bleeding. Um, he died on the scene. They resuscitated him. They had to pump him with like eight units. And they told him, he's probably never going to walk again. It'll be six to 12 months before you can stand and bear weight. Right? He was standing in two months, walking in three. Mm. I saw that. And... Something in me changed seeing my dad go through that. Yeah. And martial arts was his life. That was his passion. Yeah. He can't really do that anymore. Yeah. Uh, I, I watched his passion just get completely stripped from him. Mm -hmm. And it, it was like a calling. Going back to the hero's journey, I resisted the, I resisted the call for the first 18 years of my life. Mm -hmm. But that happened and it just changed. I just saw that, and I saw that if my dad was able to die, have his body completely shattered, yeah, and still get up and walk when they told him he couldn't, I could do anything. I have that in me. Nobody's going to hit me 
as hard as that SUV hit my dad. Yeah. If he could get up, I can get up. Yeah. Now I have a reason. Now I have a purpose. Did that he, motivation hit and it just changed. Did he talk about that experience? Like, did he say, like, was he conscious? Did he um, remember? Or? He woke up because after he flew over, like, his, he went face first into the windshield and then flipped over, went, like, 20 feet and landed in a ditch of rocks. Mm -hmm. um, and he woke up for a second started trying to get up, realized he couldn't move his legs. And he went to like frame up on his arm and it just gave out and the bone came out and he looked at his arm and he passed back out. Mm -hmm. But just seeing him go through that, like, did he remember dying? Kinda. I, 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 I don't know. I don't know. Mm. He, he went black, you know, mm. he just had that like lapse. He, and then he woke up in the hospital. No, what's he do now? Is he disabled? Like, yeah, he's he's been walking around more, um, but he's still having surgeries all the time. Yeah, like it, it's a never-ending journey with that. Yeah, um, he just had another surgery a, a few months back because they had to use chains to keep his hips together. Mm. Um, so he's got a bunch of chains and metal rods inside of him, and the first time they did it, they had faulty hardware. And the chain broke off, but he was still walking around for months before they could get him into a surgery. Mm. Like w when he, when it first happened they were telling him, don't try anything. You know, you, you can't stand, you can't walk. When the nurses w would start packing it in and it'd be nighttime, nobody would be bugging him. He couldn't feel his legs, but he would still get out of the bed and force them to move. He taught himself how to walk again. Yeah. When they wouldn't even consider that. Yeah. And just seeing him be able to do that completely changed my perception of life and what I'm doing. It, it gave me that purpose. Mm. Now I have that. Yeah. It's my dad's legacy. That's why I'm the Dragonborn. His Kempo studio was called Black Dragon. Mm. That's why I'm Dragonborn. It's not just a Skyrim reference. Yeah. It's my dad. Yeah. I'm Dragonborn. That got it right there. It's hard. That that's why I am who I am. Yeah. I I am my father's legacy. And I aim to continue that and capitalize, be able to help him and help my mom, you know, single mother. You know, she's working in the school district. You know, and school districts aren't the greatest. No. You know, so I want to be able to provide for her, help out my dad, because the insurance companies have completely fucked us over time and time again. I don't know all the details, but a lot of the surgeries, like, weren't even paid for. Mm. So he's in big debt now, and he's not able to get a job to pay it off. Yeah. So he, he just goes on day by day. We do what we can to support yeah. You know, but so what's your what are your next steps? What are your next fights? What, what's your progression going to look like into the fight scene? I was aiming for August 5th initially because um, there was an event in Texas that I wanted to do. But I'm trying to move out. Have a new because when you move, you, you start fresh, you know, your mm -hmm. surroundings are different and it's easier to keep yourself sharp, mm -hmm. you know keep yourself on track and I'm trying to do that this summer and I don't think I'm going to be able to afford moving out within a couple weeks yeah. of a trip to Texas. That's, that's unlikely. So I'm looking at September right now. Yeah. That, that's where I'm aiming. I'm sticking with street beefs for a little bit. Cause I, I'm still new to the game. You know, I've only been doing MMA for a couple of years, yeah. you know, and I want to be able to give myself a certain level of experience before I start going into the amateur brackets mm -hmm. and eventually going pro. Um, Cause I see a lot of people rushing it going in too early. Cause I want my mental prime and my physical prime to align with the point where I could be in like a championship contention. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't want to wait too long and be like, 
36 years old, just breaking the top 10. But I also don't want to do it too early to where I don't have the experience to get the belt and keep the belt. Yeah. Because that happens a lot. That's why you have a lot of champions that just have like one or two title defenses. I want to be like Demetrius Johnson was. Yeah. Like he went in, he defended his belt 11 times. You look at the flyweight division in UFC history, you combine every other champion's title defenses. They have nine combined. He had 11 on his own. Insane. Yeah. I mean, Demetrius Johnson, he was he was an inspiration to me growing up because he was the small guy, flyweight division. Yeah. You know, I was able to relate to that. And the shit that he would do was crazy. He did a suplex into an arm bar. Yeah. My God, sexy. <laughs> I, I saw that in elementary school. I, I, I broke one of my friend's arm in, in fourth grade. It was stupid. We were playing with this big yoga ball. I told him to stop, and he chucked it right right at my face. I started bleeding, and I just bum-rushed him and put him in an arm bar, and I, I just went too far with it. But <laughs> it's crazy now, looking back, though, because two fights in, not even amateur, Demetrius Johnson – Made a fight breakdown of my last fight the day it came out. That's insane. So, like, having that... Were you able to get a hold of him? Like, he he has his Discord. Somebody put it in their chat. I left a comment on one of his other Street Beef's reactions, and he replied to it. Um, So, that kind of, I guess, planted it. But as soon as it came out, somebody put it in his Discord. Yeah. Because they called it the MMA Match of the Year. Wow. Wow. Because, I mean, El Mapache was a beast. Yeah. He was a fucking beast. Bigger dude, a lot more experience, big learning experience for me. Yeah. Because I haven't encountered grappling like that before. Yeah. You know, sparring is one, th- one thing, rolling around on a mat's another, but when the submissions are real, you know, and it's not just, like, you get to a certain point, and, you know, you're both like, all right, you know, don't want to hurt you. Yeah. You know? It's different when you're actually in there. When you get locked in a cage with somebody else who's trying to break every bone in your body, yeah, it's a completely different experience. I'm I'm still mad because the ref walked in the way as I got as he got his first takedown on me. Yeah, and I I landed this elbow because he was pushing up on me, and you know you put two forces pushing up on each other. If one lets go, the other goes flying. I let go launched my elbow and it hit him right here and it broke his orbital bone and he kept going the whole fight but my grappling wasn't so hot in that fight i i've never been put up against a grappler like that because he's been doing jujitsu consistently for like six years due to stud um but it didn't feel like a loss and that that was a weird thing i expected losing to to piss me off a little bit more Mm -hmm. it was still a growing experience because like in my first fight, my striking was sloppy, and I was dissatisfied. I still got the win. I got a ground and pound TKO, you know? But my striking was sloppy, and I pride myself on being a striker. Yeah. Because that's how I grew up. I, I was never a grappler. Grappling's completely new to me. Yeah. And there's a huge learning curve when it comes to that. So I've been going off of, like, 95% intuition with that. Mm -hmm. And the intuition just didn't work in that last fight. Mm. So now I have that kick in the ass, like, yeah, you got to start fucking grappling. You got to get your cardio back up. You got to do all these things. But after my first fight, I was so dissatisfied with my striking. My whole fight camp was dedicated to striking. Yeah. And my striking was way better in this last fight. I was landing. I was throwing clean shots, landed a head kick. That felt great. That felt fantastic. My movement was good. But the takedowns, I get in the takedown defense, it's going to be different. Start working in more clinch work because I I found a bit of a home in more of a Muay Thai style. I've been running that a lot because that works with the tempo, the close range, the elbows, the knees. I get takedown defense, work in the clinch. That's prime right there. Mm. So I'm working on that. Main thing right now is cardio because I haven't been back at strong style in a bit because I was still healing for my arm. Um, But I've just been focusing on cardio mainly right now. Mm. I'm doing like five-mile runs every day is what I'm trying to do Wow. um, to really boost my cardio before I get back in there. I want to get my body back in shape 
because after the fight with the injury, I wasn't able to do very much. Yeah. So I, I started to lose a bit of that. And I, I want to cut back down because that's another problem. Because with street beefs, the weight class thing, it's there, but it's kind of not, you know. Mm. They try to find people that are close in weight, but, you know, you, you get put in the cage. People line up. How much you weigh? Uh, 150? Okay. Who's close to 150? Oh, I'm 165. All right. You want to fight? What are you going to say? No? Yeah. So I want to cut myself back down because I, I don't want to be fighting bigger guys my whole career. Mm. You know, I, I like the more even matchup when it comes to that kind of thing. Yeah. Because in grappling, that's another thing is those 15 pounds make a huge difference on the ground. Oh, absolutely. Massive difference. You start gassing out way faster. And that's like my cardio in the third round. Like, he actually started hitting me on the feet yeah. in, the, in the third round because I, I just, I could barely hold my hands up at that point. Yeah. Granted, he got me in a mounted triangle that blacked me out, and I still got out of it, though. I was on that Alexander Volkanovsky shit right there. Yeah. I started blacking out, and I said, fuck no. I'm not tapping. I did eventually. Yeah. Third arm bar. You know, it had hyper extended in the second arm bar. And then he got a weird type of arm bar in that third round because he was in mountain. He got like this inverted arm bar. Mm -hmm. And I just felt one ligament go. And I was like, no, I still got it. And then I felt two more pop. And I was like, fuck that. I'm not getting paid. Yeah. Because, <laughs> like, at this stage, it's not worth an injury like that. No. Street Beefs isn't an official record. I'm still 0 and 0. Yeah. Technically. I haven't done any amateur fights. Yeah. I'm one and one in street beefs, but I'm 0 and 0 at the end of the day. This is just experience. Yeah. Just getting the feel for it, getting comfortable in the cage, comfortable with people watching me fight, a live audience. Yeah. You know, getting out of my comfort zone. Mm. Start getting that going. I just go from there. Mm. Playing around with media. That's I'm running like test phases for different things I could do with media, different types of promotion. You know, and I've been talking about doing a podcast for a while, but talking about it's different than doing it. Doing it, yeah. I'm here now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Solid. I'm just trying to do new things, work with the promotion side of things, sponsorships, media, start seeing how all of that works when I apply it to myself. Because mm -hmm. I had done it for other people for a long time, mm. but I never applied it to myself. But it's like I was saying, like, when I started looking at MMA, I just realized every skill that I've developed in my whole life contributes to this. Yeah. It's all led up to this. This is my purpose. I don't want to rush it. No. Build yeah. the skills, test things out, see what works, see what doesn't work. Yeah. And then by the time I'm actually in there at the highest level, I'm going to be able to do shit that people aren't doing. Yeah. And that's another thing about getting into MMA at this time because it's a young sport. It hasn't been around for very long at all. Mm -hmm. Started in the nineties, you know, and I mean, it was on spike for a while, you know, not a big viewing audience. Connor came, changed the game, completely, cha completely changed the game. Now it's multi-billion dollar, company the UFC is huge it's bigger than it's ever been and it just keeps growing yeah it keeps growing and I'm able to sit back WWE. exactly that was a huge deal yeah and I'm able to sit back and see what works see what doesn't work see how the company develops and how the business side of it actually compounds with the fighters actions in and outside of the ring mm. people focus too much on just in the ring obviously I'm not discounting what you have to do in the ring. Of course, that's the most important thing at the end of the day because no matter how good you are at marketing, if you're losing fights, no one's going to care. Yeah. You have to be able to get those wins, but you have to be entertaining in there too. Yeah. And that's where some things get compromised because you get these big grapplers like Habib um, that when they're just smothering them and getting the ground and pound in the submissions, it's entertaining to people who are invested in the sport. Mm -hmm. But a more casual fan just wants to see people stand and bang. 
Yeah. You know, that's why you got people like Justin Gaethje, Michael Chandler, endless entertainment. But there's a compromise. Mm. Like, if you look at Michael Chandler, you know, he has good fight IQ, mm -hmm. but he throws a lot of it out for the sake of entertainment. Mm -hmm. And it makes him more successful. Even if he doesn't get the dub, people are still going to watch his yeah. fights. Sometimes he goes chaos mode. Exactly. And that's one thing that I know for a fact that I can bring to the table. Yeah. yeah. I you, know I'm going to be an entertainer. You roll spazzy. Exactly. Yeah. And so if that's your fight style, and I watched some highlights of your fights. We, me and Peter watched the fight. That's how we got you out here. Um, with the black guy you fought? Mm -hmm. Zay Tobin. Okay. Is that your first one? Yep. Okay, yeah. So we watched that. And yeah, you, you definitely move spicy, bro. You know what yeah. You definitely move spicy. I, I, I was sloppy in the beginning, but in the second round, I got that clean combo. With yeah. The slip, the uppercut, the two hooks. If that... If that uppercut landed at the end of the combo it was wide it yeah. was so wide if i threw a kick there it would have landed it's different when you're live but you know what i mean when exactly you're when you're live and the adrenaline's going right you're not way consciously different. thinking yeah. there are thoughts but it's not processed yeah. the same way way different i'm like 100 to know in amateur fights against my sister well there you go there you go that's a good record uh, 101 this one time she sneak attacked okay. me okay okay <laughs> almost mayweather almost <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, one time I stabbed you and you went down. <laughs> you ever see Rod Tang? I don't think the I have. The Iron Man? He's at one championship. He's a Muay Thai guy. Wu Tang? Guy. I have no Rod idea. Rod Tang. No, I have no idea. Dude's crazy. Yeah. He started professionally fighting when he was eight years old. Oh, my God. Eight years old, he started pro. I would have beat him at an eight-year-old. Now he has, I think he just got his 272nd <laughs> win or 240. Goodness. Like he's that's insane. It's absolutely absurd. That's Dude's insane. got a chin like no other. Yeah, and that's another thing that I'm grateful for. I got a really good chin. Yeah, I can imagine you having a good like, chin. Like <laughs> with the fight with Mapache, like I didn't realize how much I was getting hit. Yeah, like I walked out of that fight thinking I only got hit like three, four times. Yeah, I watch it back. I'm fucking taking elbow after elbow after elbow. Dude, Loki beat the fuck out of me on the ground. Yeah, he he, he really did. But like. I just don't feel it. The The adrenaline's a huge part of oh, it. Oh, it's so like, huge. It, it's hard to get me rocked. Yeah. That's why the submissions were, were good, because that's different. Yeah. That's different than getting hit. Yeah. I can take a fucking hit. Yeah. I, I got that Italian stubbornness yeah. in my mind. You know, I, I got yeah. my dad in me. Yeah. You know, nobody's going to hit hard enough. <laughs> yeah. No, a thousand percent, man. Well, as we wrap up, is there anything else you want to talk about? Not specifically that comes to mind. Um, you know, probably come back out here. Yes. When I start getting Update us. more updates. Update you know, I'm kind of. We'll test that jujitsu out again. Yes, see sir. How you're doing. Absolutely. I'll bring my mouth guard next time yes. so I don't get a yeah, split please. lip. <laughs> please bring your mouth guard. Um, but yeah, because right now it, it's been kind of a bit of a stalemate because I got a lot of things going on in life. Yeah. Trying to move out and. My work schedule hasn't been working with training all that much because mm. I'm, I'm at Domino's right now yeah. slinging pizzas. Oh, yeah. You know? I'm starving. And they don't got enough drivers, <laughs> really. <laughs> so, you know, my schedule yeah. doesn't really align with You got to do what you got to do, though, much. bro. Like, I got to be able to pay the bills. Do you watch that McGregor documentary on uh, Netflix? I haven't watched it yet. I've been meaning to get around to it. Yeah, let me see here. I can't wait till they're in Marauder. Marauder documentaries, that's going to be cool. Yeah. Dragonborn. Yeah. I mean, shit. Let's go. Well, hey, Mikey Murata. Yes, sir. Dragonborn, MMA. It was awesome rolling with you today. It was awesome spending an hour with you. And Absolutely. All this time. We get a cigar last night with Castagli. Oh, yeah. That was Castagli. awesome. That Hopefully, was I get him on the podcast amazing. as well. Best so, cigar I've ever had. Yeah, man. It was a phenomenal cigar. And uh, you, you've just been you've been uh, a pleasure to Absolutely. have you as out well. here and to you know, have you visit and everything like that. So... Man, if you need anything, let us know, and hopefully we get you on in the next year or two. Absolutely. Get an update. Absolutely. Let's go. Cool.